All right, take two. TJ Reed, thanks for coming out, buddy. Thanks for sitting down with me for a little while. Thank you for having me. Yeah, very excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. This is not your first time at the lodge, right? Uh, definitely double digits at the lodge. Probably, oh, really? Probably that many times? 12, 15 times at this point. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. What what uh, what keeps you coming back to the place, man? Uh, I mean, Texas poker in general is special. The lodge was my first introduction to Texas poker. Oh, really? Way That's back a good intro. In the old room. Yeah, I think yeah. I I had um I had looked up. Uh, you know a little bit about you before and i realized that you had played on the stream before like in the, in the earliest days yeah. like um when it was just like table table 12 or whatever it was under under uh uh the center the center stage in the other room over there so yep yeah always been a good experience here uh always fantastic yep. I, I came down that time i emailed skull mm -hmm. decided on a whim to come down it was like two weeks before and he said sorry we don't have any spots open yeah but he said come down anyway we'll see what happens sometimes people cancel mm. uh met up with him hopped into uh, like the pregame yeah uh and just you know, gambled and bluffed nonstop <laughs> for four hours by the end of it skull guy you, you have a seat that's so, a <laughs> that's a good way to lock up a seat with yeah. skull is uh show that you can give a little bit of action so you know, that, that's really cool so how how have you really liked seeing the evolution of of the stream? I mean, you saw it at its you know beginning, but now it's pretty different than what it used to be. So, what do you think of it so far? Uh, every iteration has been a fantastic improvement, and yeah. to the point now, this is like top of the line. Mm -hmm. This is state state of the art, right? Yeah. Back in the old room, it was great. It was fun, um, and you know, commentators have always been great. Uh, action has always been fantastic, but like the quality, it was a startup basically, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I still loved it, but then saw them move over here. And just seeing the Lodge expand over here, yeah. period, has been great. Over there it was, you know, step up. Yeah. But coming into this room, there's like there's nothing like playing in this room. The cam yeah. camera quality, fantastic. Audio, fantastic. And just like have a game host, comfortable seats, mm -hmm. comfortable environment, and feel safe. Uh, snacks and drinks. So you, you get taken care of when you play here. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I've, I've played a few different places around the country. And the, the, it's very true. I've only recently started playing the stream more. But it it's very true that this is incredibly comfortable. It's all looking so clean. And I mean that the setup that we had in the room in between transition while this was being built was always meant to be temporary. But once you go from something like that into suddenly this, like it really was like quite a leap. You know, once we had Doug and Andrew and Brad and everybody come on to the team and really start moving things forward, it just like exploded. And now, you know, we're talking about opening up multiple clubs and like potentially having multiple streams and stuff like that. So it's been, it's been a pretty quick rise. Um, and it's, uh, it's all looking really clean. We're really proud of the room. So as you should be when yeah. Doug, when Doug and team took over and then they talked about wanting to build a state of the art studio, like mm -hmm. from that moment, I knew that you were going to have something amazing. Yeah. Didn't know exactly what it was going to be. But to see it come to life and now air, what are you doing, three, four nights a week these yeah, days? Yeah, four nights a week, yeah. Just fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty great. We are we really are proud of this. Uh, I, Me, myself, and the, uh, the two guys helping were actually part of the install team that did, like, the cameras and everything. It did a lot of the equipment. Um, and we also got to watch this thing get built from the ground up while, like, the artist was doing all of the, the wall work and everything else. It was it was a really cool experience to just kind of see it all come to life, you know, yeah. and then uh, get it to where it is now. So hopefully it's uh, it's around for indefinitely, you know, for, for ways to come. But um, I appreciate you sitting down with me, man. Uh, I noticed that you recently had just uh, come off a pretty big tournament score uh, off of the uh, the Run Good main event at uh, Thunder Valley. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. That's your biggest score, isn't it? Yeah, biggest score. Yeah. Uh, just over 192K. It was a $2,500 one mil guarantee Run Good. I love Run Good stops. Okay. So much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Tonic Arn, who owns the, uh, one of the co-owners of that company, just really cares about players and producing a fun environment. Mm -hmm. for, so you'll see events that you won't see anywhere else. There's like a Buffalo PKO on this schedule. Oh, interesting. Uh, but this was the the season finale. Mm -hmm. And so it was the bigger buy-in than usual, one mil guarantee. They hit the guarantee, thankfully. And mm -hmm. at Thunder Valley, which is a, a great place to play up in mm -hmm. Northern California. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, it was, it was nearly 500 runners in that thing. And the top, I, I came into day three, second of 20 in chips. Okay, pretty good start. Came in great and just ran hot in all the big spots and held when it mattered. And the final table was full of absolute crushers. I think we had four WSO pre bracelets and four or five WPT titles. Yeah, Jaffe was on the final Jaffe table. Jaffe was right? on the final yeah, table with Tyler sweet. Patterson. Um, yeah, yeah. Crushers, but I just had so many chips. My mm. life was easy. Yeah, no, it's it's nice uh, to come into a situation like that where, like, even when you know 
that the entire field is you know going to be tough that you you can still come out on top just because you've run well enough at that point to like have an actual stack and it kind of makes it easier when they're very very good players yeah in uh, icm situations like that where everybody has to play so tight because of risk premium right you want them to be good players yeah right yeah you don't want them to just be lackadaisical with their hands and everything because like that is risk that you then have to take on as well to, to either um to avoid dumping chips or to try and chip up yourself so it's uh it's kind of it gets really interesting at final tables when there is like a wild card that has managed to survive that long you know it really throws a wrench into a lot of things but if you've got a lot of different professionals who understand like the subtleties and stuff like that it's it's a little bit easier to navigate because you know that everybody's essentially sitting there like guns out against each other you know like not trying to get too involved but still picking their spots well and um just seems a little less chaotic, I think. Yeah, I had yeah. at one point like sixty percent of the chips in play with seven that's, players left. That's a good good place to be. And, yeah. and Jaffe, oh, he was trolling me all night. I'm on Jaffe's shit list. Can I say that? I don't know. <laughs> For years, like I made a full house against his trips uh-huh. that just devastated him and gave me the chip lead. Uh, but he, yeah, when I had sixty percent of the chips, he looks at me. He goes, "We'll give you fourth place money right now. You can get out of here." And I was just like, "No, he's trolling me because I'm one of the least experienced players at that table." Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I wasn't taking that deal, and it worked, uh, and it worked out. That's cool. Yeah, no, it, it worked out for sure. It sounds like it was a pretty great experience. Do you usually play uh, tournaments, or do you mostly stick to cash? I'm mostly tournaments these days. Probably okay. like 90 percent tournaments, and all almost all of my study goes mm-hmm. into tournaments. Um, grew up playing cash, cash throughout my 20s, mm-hmm. pandemic hit, kind of switched over to tournaments, recognized that there was a shift in uh, value, I suppose. Mm-hmm. The tournaments are bigger and better than ever, offered all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and as somebody who wanted to travel more, seemed like a good reason to do so. so yeah, that makes uh, sense for sure. All my focus is on tournaments. I, I just like to sprinkle in cash now and then, kind of at stops when games are good or in stream games and stuff like that. But yeah, it's mostly yeah. tournaments. Yeah, days. well, you definitely showed up for the games you played this weekend. You, uh, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, 100, 192K win a couple of days ago. And then I think between two streams, you're up like 36K or something like that. I think so. uh, I think even more, not to toot my own horn, but like 32K yeah. on Friday and then like 16K yesterday. So almost yeah. 50, almost fifty. I mean, it was fun to watch, man. It was uh, it was you were just running over the games and uh, spots. It was I, great. I, I, I was. It definitely helped having that big score in my back pocket yeah, coming here to play right, these games. Right, right. And they even said stuff on on Friday. It's like, oh, he's got tournament money. Yeah. You know? So I was <laughs> I was here. I was ready to gamble, ready to splash around, still hoping to make some money, and it worked out. No, well, that's good, man. Well, I'm glad to hear that the run good has uh, been good to you, and I hope it continues on for the next couple of weeks uh do you, what's your next tournament stop i'm going up to grayton for the wsop circuit oh i see okay. it's in uh, ronert park which is like bay area um which is one of the closest major casinos to where i live mm-hmm. it's still four and a half hours away but i see where they, do you live uh up in uh humboldt county okay uh, city's mckinleyville closest big city is like Arcata Eureka. I see. It's not that big. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it sounds kind of small town. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I know Eureka, but that's about it. So yeah. But yeah, that, well, that's cool. So you said that you mostly started in cash. How did you really get into poker? Because I also, when I was like looking up some stuff about you, I, I heard that you're a, Jeho- a Jehovah's Witness or you used to be. Yeah. And so that doesn't really strike me as a group that's, um, really into gambling all that much, you know, <laughs> notoriously a little bit maybe sheltered. So how did you first discover poker despite being a uh, part of that? It's a really, really long story that I won't bore you with all the details. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, I did grow up as Jehovah's Witness, no gambling. Mm. Um, and I started basically towards the end of my Jehovah's Witness uh, run, I, I started living a double life in a lot of ways. So I started mm. gambling. I was living in New York City. Okay. At Bethel, which is the world headquarters for Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. right. And, I, and I started doing things you're not supposed to do, mm. one of which was gambling. Mm. So I took a Greyhound bus out to Atlantic City and uh, bar hopped, uh, drank really for the first time in my life. I had a list of like the top 10 cocktails and I just went down the list. Bar hopped, <laughs> beer, wine. Uh, whiskey, martini. You, I got sick that you dove right in. <laughs> yeah. I guess you're just like you know what? Just give give me all of it. Yeah. Give me all of it. I haven't had any of this. I want all of it now. I, I didn't do all. Like I was also homeschooled, so I didn't do all the things that a teenager does right. until I was I, like I was a 22 year old living out 15 year old life. Yeah. Right. All the things I'd never done. So uh, that involved gambling as well. I played like roulette and blackjack. I mm-hmm. didn't get into poker until I came back uh, to St. Louis. Um, kind of left Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, came back to Missouri. And then I started playing poker, basically 
casino night with friends. Mm -hmm. I've always loved card games, board games. Um, knew a couple people who like played poker professionally, although it was just their side income. Mm -hmm. um, and tried poker. First hand I ever got dealt in a one three game was pocket aces, and I doubled up. Really? Wow, that's first hand. I what ever a got start! It. What it a start! It was so man. obvious. I was new. <laughs> like I didn't know what I was doing, and a guy tried to bluff me, and I was like, I call. And he goes, oh, that was bad timing. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I hand. racked up within 10 minutes. Um, and, and I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is wonderful. I mm -hmm. just made so many playing cards. And then for the next year, proceeded to lose. Um, but just fell in love with the game. Uh, I had other jobs. I was working in, like, restaurant industry and service industry, retail, stuff like that, looking for some sort of passion or some sort of way to make a living and something I didn't hate doing. Mm -hmm. And poker came along. So for a, a couple years, like, I had one person who really helped me figure out how to make a living in this game. And he said, you got to track everything. Mm -hmm. You've got to treat it like a small business, be responsible, stop the pits, like all, all the best advice for a newbie. Um, and so I tracked my results for a couple of years and eventually was making more money doing that than I was as a bartender and, and less and less bartending and more and more poker. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was like a pretty smooth transition over time. That kind of seems how, how it is for most people is that uh, – you know, you pick it up as a hobby, then you start going a little bit more often, then you start to realize the real potential of it. Yeah. And then after a while, once you take it seriously, you're like, oh, I can actually do this maybe full time. So th that kind of seems like it was your story. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I, it's one of those things where you, I didn't want to go broke. Right. I never wanted to go broke. I mean, broke. I'm not sure anyone really <laughs> does. <laughs> yeah. Some people are more uh, open to taking that risk and jumping in a little early, like mm -hmm. completely abandoning their previous source of income and just jumping in mm -hmm. with. 12 buy-ins and seeing what happens. Like, right. that's not how I wanted to do it. Right. I wanted to make sure that I, I did a smooth, easy transition. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely the responsible way to do it. I think a lot of people underestimate just how many buy-ins you might need for a stake whenever you're actually building a role, whenever you decide to take on playing more than, say, like 15, 20 hours a week. You really need something to weather some of the variance because, yeah. like, no matter how good of a poker player you are, you're going to get hit with that eventually. Like, it's just raw numbers. Yeah. So you got to be prepared for it. You got to take it easy, take it slow. And then that usually the people that do that the best, that pays off in the long run. Yeah, it's so, not sexy. Yeah, it's, hey, it's not. They don't I make movies was, about that. Yeah, that's yeah. Kanish. That's the side <laughs> character. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kanish, yeah. I'm going to let you borrow the van. Uh, but yeah, so you just got to take it easy, take it slow, and, and get into it gradually over time. But I'm glad that it's worked out for you. I mean, clearly it's worked out for you, um, you know, if the results of the last week or anything to say for it. So Just as, like, you have to be prepared for downswings, mm -hmm. you should also prepare yourself for upswings. Right, yeah. And the, not a lot of people don't talk about that. Like, upswings are real. Like, momentum's real. That Each day is a new day. But you winner's tilt is a big thing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right? You mm -hmm. win a big score, and then you're, like, happy to lose some money. Try to avoid that. Like, maybe you splash around. Maybe you take some bigger shots. Maybe play some games that, like, are a little above what you usually play. Mm -hmm. um, but you got to enjoy the upswings, too, and be willing to ride that momentum and and, and hope it lasts as long as it can. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really good advice. I think people underestimate a lot of things about poker, but winter still really is a thing. Like, you start to get this mindset of like i'm the best ever you know if you run good for a while and you just kind of just make sense like everything you do just works out or like you just start making a ton of money maybe a lot more money than you're used to it's easy to be like to justify the small things that leak out money over time like maybe giving action spots you shouldn't or like trying to take shots at bigger and bigger games um that maybe your role isn't quite prepared for uh, i mean it's fine if you do that every now and then but it is something that you really got to rein in over time and that can really mess with your head if you're not really prepared for that going into yeah. it. I think life lessons like outside of poker, how often do you see one hit wonders or celebrities go broke for that very reason? Right. Or why do lottery winners go broke? Mm -hmm. It's because they don't know how to handle money. They've never hand, ha had money or they're responsible with it because they feel like it'll last forever. Mm -hmm. A sense of entitlement, like you win a tournament, like, oh, well, money's always going to be there now. So like, it doesn't matter if I you know, lose 20K this weekend or lose 40K this weekend. Right. And, and that's where... Yeah, you yeah. don't want to go down that route. So, yeah, um, I'm not trying to say I'm not being a little bit of a hypocrite here because I'll take shots and I'll gamble and I'll and I'll play bigger games. But you, you pick your spots carefully and you mm -hmm. don't just assume that life's always going to be easy. Right, just because you had a good week. Yeah, you know exactly, exactly. Well, that's good mindset. That's all. That's all really good advice. So, how did you get into journalism specifically? Because as I understand, those were kind of two separate things that you had going, and then they sort of merged. Uh, together later on. Yeah, it's exactly right. I, I, like I said, played cash in my 20s. Uh, COVID hit, stopped playing poker, decided to go back to school. Mm -hmm. Moved out to Idaho uh, for my partner. She is a doctor. Mm -hmm. And um, so she started, uh, she went to med school out there. 
uh, and, or residency out there. Med school in St. Louis where we met, residency in Idaho. Mm. Her residency was connected to a school. And so I went back to school for $5 per credit, basically free. Pretty fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and I decided to do something that uh, I, I just loved. Didn't really know what I want to do with it, but I went back for writing. So mm. I took creative writing major. Okay. Um, and then towards my final year, I was like, ah, probably a good idea to go out and get some job experience in this mm. because that experience is everything when it comes to jobs in the creative fields. Right? Yeah. Um, and so to figure out how do I do this? What job do I want? So I just start writing for myself and try to get published. And then uh, Poker News the WSOP partner in the summer mm -hmm. uh, hires uh, reporters every year, rookie reporters. So I didn't really know what that meant or what it was. Wasn't familiar with the world very much in tournament poker and um, applied. Now I know, not hard to get that job. Right. Uh, if, if you know poker and you can write a full sentence. <laughs> yeah, you're available. qualified? Yeah, yeah, you're qualified. I see. Um, and so I got it, went down there, did the whole summer, which is a grind. Mm. Uh, you're not going to get rich doing it, but if you, it's really if you love poker mm. and you want to be around the WSOP, it's 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 good. Um, so I did that. I think made like 150 bucks a day uh, working for seven weeks straight in Vegas, and then um, did, took a couple other gigs with them. But then in the fall, uh, got a position with Poker.org, mm -hmm. who, who I work for now mm -hmm. uh, as a writer. Okay. So that's really more what I wanted to do was more creative, creating my own pieces, interviewing people, telling stories. Mm -hmm. So I started with them uh, the, in like fall 2022, and I've been with them since. They're, they've been a, a, a startup in a lot of ways, but they've come a long way. We've come a long way in a short time, um, and now I'm working as their events manager. Right. I saw that you're the the live events coordinator. Like, What, what exactly does that role entail on top of just doing the writing for the articles? It's a lot of um, client management, um, you know, whoever we work for, bring us out. We're, we're doing live reporting with the WSOP circuit partner. We were last year and we're this year as well. So we're the exclusive media partners of that. Mm -hmm. Just making sure that we have the right people in the right places, delivering the right product, that everyone's happy. Um, sending contracts out to clients, making sure we can deliver what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of liaisons, like somebody might reach out to one of our people saying, hey, so all you guys are doing live reporting. We're kind of interested in shaking it up or, or you know, shining a spotlight on our casino or our event mm. and, you know, having that initial conversation, see what they're looking for, see what we can do and see for what price, that sort of thing. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That's um, That seems like a job that can fit very well with uh, traveling to play poker. You know, I'm yeah. sure that you not only travel to play poker, but have to to do that kind of work, like you're going to events all around the country, maybe some of which people haven't even heard of. Like, I, quite frankly, I'm not very familiar with Run Good series, but I think that's kind of the point, right, is that right. you're going to different areas to bring more focus, more attention to all of these different poker organizations and the events that are going all around the country. So that seems like something that really aligns well with um, with being able to to blend um, playing poker alongside of it. So. Yeah, and I'm super appreciative. Like, mm. I, I feel very lucky that I, I work for a a company that values somebody who is in the trenches and mm -hmm. somebody who knows the game well and mm -hmm. likes to play the game because I feel like they make the best content, right? Mm -hmm. Like if, if we had to have a stark separation in, in players and employees, I don't think we'd get as good of a product. So I'm yeah. happy like, as long as it doesn't interfere with our work, as long as we get our responsibilities done, yeah. uh, it, we, we view it as a good thing. We want people who play poker to work for us. Yeah, yeah. no, that's cool. That that definitely makes a lot of sense. It seems very, very wholesome in a way yeah. that um, you guys essentially want your employees to be embraced in the community, want to embrace the community and be embraced by it. Yeah. So for, for that to happen, you kind of have to have poker players on staff, people that actually love the game, that yep. know about the game. So that, that seems really a really good way to create not only a unique um, news platform, but something that's very effective as well for outreach and stuff like that. So that's really, really cool. Um, what what are your favorite events to cover? Like, I'm sure you've been to plenty of different ones, and I'm sure you're busy, like you mentioned before, like covering the WSOP out in Vegas, but I'm sure there's one that you probably look forward to all the time. Uh, yeah, WSOP in Vegas is is a special thing. Mm. I remember the first time I walked into that room. There's nothing like the Thunderdome in WSOP. Yeah. So I think as far as vibe, um, either the WSOP main event deep, but that's an easy answer. I really think – it's an excellent question, by mm. the way, because it makes me think. Mm. I think like WSOP circuit ladies events, believe it or not, mm -hmm. have some of the best vibe in the world. Really? Yeah. Yeah. 
they deserve more coverage than they get. And that's one of the reasons that I'm excited to, to have that coverage for the year again. Mm -hmm. We're trying to give even more enhanced coverage. It is something that I feel like has been lost in tournament poker a lot is what happens at these events. Mm. Not exclusively WSOP circuit, ladies events period. There are groups designed to push, promote the ladies events. They support each other. It really feels more like they're all in it together than mm -hmm. cutthroat. Yeah. Um, so that would be probably my first answer as far as what I think is good for the game, what I like seeing in the game. So mm -hmm. enjoy covering pretty much any ladies event. Yeah, no, that's really cool. We have some ladies events that happen here and very much the same thing that you spoke about happens here is like there's like a different level of camaraderie with uh, the women that come here to play poker, especially when they all get around together. Mm. Um, I mean, poker is a male dominated sport by far, what, 95% plus, you know, uh, of the field is men. So I think there's like an extra deep layer of camaraderie around when a bunch of women can can uh, come and play poker. And it's really great to see, honestly, because like I would much prefer the diversity to be way better just because it hasn't been for so long. Like we need more women in poker. We need more attention drawn to events like that to help other women feel comfortable getting into the game. Cause I'm sure it's incredibly intimidating, right? Like sitting down, being the only woman in a full ring of just other men is like probably not the most comfortable feeling. And so it's really cool to see that not only are these ladies events becoming more popular, um, that that same kind of concept applies across multiple uh, ladies events where they all seem to just be really excited about it. But not only that, but the news organizations are really intent on like giving them more coverage, like you said, so. Yeah, it's, I really enjoy it for all those reasons because the barrier of entry is high, mm -hmm. because it's not always a welcoming environment. Mm -hmm. The women's events provide those. You know, a lot of times they're polarizing. I don't think they should be. I don't think they should be. I, I think that they create an environment that grows the biggest untapped market in poker. Yeah. And so who would be upset about that? Right. Only people who are looking for a reason to be offended because of some other fragile, you know, masculinity problem. Right. Um, but when when we welcome them with open arms, we create healthy environments, we create a supportive uh, group for them, um, that's only good for the game. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they win that, that women's event and now they're more comfortable playing the main that weekend. Yeah. And, well, great, we just created a long-term poker player. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, that's what those events are doing. And even if they only play every women's event, that's mm. that's fine too. Yeah, it's good for the good for the community, um, good for you know their friends who may never have thought about playing poker. See them in a winner's pick and they're like, oh, now I'll come out. And it's just you see the snowball effect for right. Like that. So that's that's why I think uh, it's good for everyone to have these events on schedules. Yeah, no, that that's definitely a good point. I mean, the entire I think goal or driving force behind a lot of poker media is to draw more attention to the game, and if literally half the population is less interested than the other half, then like that really is an untapped source of new people to come play. Like is, I mean, it just seems like such a good way to grow the game by, you know, 40, 50% yeah. then by, um, by getting more women to play poker, feel comfortable playing poker, getting them interested in poker. And like you said, even if they just show up to play ladies events, like that's fantastic as well, just because it creates such a nice environment to have other people come in a lot more more comfortably, a lot uh, feel a lot more safer getting into the game. Things yeah, like that. that's why you saw Kristen Fox and make a deep run in the main this right. year. Right, yeah, great whole world, Whole poker world rallied yeah. around her. Everyone wanted her because we knew what it meant for the game. Yeah. If fantastic. she won, she's probably the only person in that field who could have done the rounds on late night television. Mm -hmm. Like she could right. have been on like the big late night shows mm -hmm. promoting poker. Yeah. So that's what uh, like a wimp, a woman entering the game or winning a big event could do. Anastasia played with us last night. Oh, did she? Yeah. yeah she hopped in with Sat about down. an hour left. Yeah. Guess what? Chat goes crazy. Yeah. You know, she's got the shortest stack at the table. We've been playing for six hours. She hops in and chat's crazy. They're putting it on on Twitter. It's easy to rally behind. And, and, you know, there's one big hand where she got it in with top set and I had a gut shot. Everyone's rooting against me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you dare put a jack out there or whatever. Yeah. Which I would have been too. Yeah. Uh, and so that just speaks to the power that, like, this audience that people desperately want to see represented in, in the game, mm -hmm. uh, we should support that. 
yeah. in any way we can. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I didn't know she hopped in the game yesterday. Yeah. I, I didn't work uh, I didn't work the stream yesterday. I was dealing, so I didn't know about that. But that's a, that's a really fun little tidbit. I'm going to have to go back and watch that for sure. Very first hand she got dealt was Pocket Kings. Oh, for, fantastic. It goes four ways. Yeah. Uh, and she, she yeah, I won't spoil it, but yeah. uh, it was yeah. a good one for her. Heck yeah, man. No, that's <laughs> cool. We need we need moments like that. So that's that, that's really cool to hear that, that we you know can have that happen in, in our own studio. Yeah. Well, man, it's clear that you have a lot of passion for the game itself. You know, you've been in the industry. How I'm sorry, how old are you? How old am I? Yeah, uh, 36. 36. So you've been in the industry for about a decade now or so. Um, playing poker, I started when I was 22, okay. uh, but I didn't always play full time. So right. I've been around it for 14 years. As far as in the industry, like in on the media side, less than four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Well, it it's clear that you have a lot of passion for the game. What um, what about the creative writing aspect? Like, what about poker? impassions your writing like what makes it fun to write about for you personally i think that there are so many stories to tell in poker mm -hmm. and a lot of them are untold mm -hmm. you walk into a random tournament room and there's thousands of people sometimes in these fields and every person's got a story mm -hmm. and so to, as a creative writer source material is unlimited everything yeah uh, and finding those cool stories are just like I wish I had more time to do so. Yeah. But we have a great team of writers, and I'm writing less and less as I do more on the business side. I see. Uh, but that's what you know. I just feel like when you look at poker, your average audience member, your average reader, is probably familiar with like the top twenty players, right? Mm. More so than anything else. And you just see stories about them over and over again which is cool like we need those that star power right and to know how d-negs did this summer right that sort of thing yeah. but i want to know how like mary from nebraska felt after winning her first circuit ring mm -hmm. or uh you know pick the, the group of people that sends one person to the main event every year from their home game mm -hmm. uh, and those stories that just represent all of us more so yeah. than the 0.1 percent yeah so i think as a writer when, when you're looking for stories uh poker offers as many as you're willing to invest the time to find mm -hmm. yeah i see yeah that's i really like that answer because my favorite thing about poker in general is the people like mm -hmm. i love the game you know i've studied and played for you know four or five years now pretty consistently and um i just the thing that excites me the most is getting to talk to people at the table, mm -hmm. like getting to chat because there's really not a lot of other hobbies or sports or anything else that you do where you're going to sit down and there's such a wealth of different professions or different walks of life that all sit down to come play cards, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's always just the most fun thing uh, about the community in general is that it's just so diverse. And there's, like you said, there's a story um, in everybody. And it's always really cool whenever we can highlight those, those, um, those individuals, because I agree with you that it very much is a representation of us as a population to talk about, you know, the everyday man that, that sits down to play poker. You know, that's why, that's why the poker boom happened, right? Chris Moneymaker was, you know, for lack of a better word, like he was nobody in poker yeah. and all of a sudden he won the main event and then everybody's like, well, you know, let's go play some poker. And so I think it's really important to highlight people like that, moments like that. And it's really cool that you guys kind of have the same mindset. So Yeah, it's, you know, any other sport or you cover the Olympics, you these nine guys doing shot put, like they're mm -hmm. all professional shot put players. Right. And then the interesting tidbits are like, oh, his hobby is this, mm -hmm. right? And that's an interesting tidbit. In poker, you could have nine people with nine different professions, nine different backgrounds, nine different age groups, and there's all an individual story. And so th their their hobby might be poker. Yeah. And that just doesn't happen in other sports, mm -hmm. you know. There, in other sports, everyone is a professional mm -hmm. as far as the media goes, right? And then the tidbits are about their life. In poker, like their whole story is is the tidbit. Yeah. yeah. No, that's I, I like that because poker is one of those few games where like the vast majority of people that play it are not professionals, yeah. and sometimes those are the best people to highlight yeah. just because it's it's just so cool to see somebody who maybe takes a game kind of seriously or just plays recreationally, just goes on a big run and like makes life changing money from yeah. a game that they played as a hobby. So that's, that, that's what I find most beautiful about the game. So it, it's cool to hear that a lot of people, I, and as I'm interviewing more people, a lot of people have that same sentiment. Yeah. I think that's what really draws people into the community like this. You know, it gets poker gets kind of a bad rap a lot of the time for people that don't really 
know much about it like it's gambling you know yeah. it's you know there's a lot of negative sides to it i'm not going to say there isn't it can be kind of a um a seedy community at times and things like that but there's a lot of really really cool you know nuggets within it there's a lot of really cool people that play and a lot of really cool stories to tell so it's cool that poker org is really trying to focus on some of that stuff i think you're exactly right is those stories do more for growing the game than anything else mm -hmm. the we need the ivies we need the negranios we need even the villains, we, you know, um, and we need, you know, people who, who make a lot of money from this game, professionals, we're like as a media organization, I'm not naive, they get clicks, mm -hmm. right? And right. we don't survive without people reading stories. Right. But the better stories that grow the game are the down-home people, the mm -hmm. average everyday Americans who in lo love this game mm -hmm. and why they love it. And, you know, they're never going to make huge headlines unless we pluck them out and tell their story. Uh, for winning a four hundred dollar event, yeah. whatever it might be, and those are where the nuggets are that have ripple effects to do good for our game, and that's you know our goal is by the players for the players, not just the super elite players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good mindset. Um, moving into poker org specifically, I wanted to ask you a few questions about that. Like a lot of people from the outside looking in might not think of poker as something that really needs. A lot of media outlets to cover it right but there's still quite a wealth of different ones um there's you know sites like poker news card player yourselves um what does poker org do to stand out among all the different news sites that cover poker i'll try to answer this without like just giving us big pats on the back uh. but <laughs> what what i'm proud of that we do is one we're independent so we're an independent organization. Um, that's not the case with many of our competitors. A lot of them are media or marketing outlets for the companies that own them. Mm -hmm. We're independent. We're in it because we love it. We're in it because we feel like they we poker needed an independent voice to represent the players, to tell the stories that need to be told, to you know expose things that need to be exposed uh, without fear of retribution or some parent company saying we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what we're really about. Again, the majority of our people on our team are poker fans or poker players or both and have been around. We've put together a team of the best of the best, in my opinion. So, you know, Brad Willis, our editor in chief, who's an old poker stars guy, Sarah mm -hmm. Herring, who's been around the game for over a decade in media and one of the best presenters in the game. Mm -hmm. um, our writers, our presenters, I just think everyone that works for us is amazing and we all get along and we all love poker and we all want what's best for the game mm -hmm. and we're independent. And and I, we've come a, so far, we've been punching above our weight for a long time mm -hmm. to allow us to build a good reputation quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, we have an owner, uh, Eric Holreiser, who is willing to invest what he feels is we need. Mm -hmm. And he just, uh, he's very smart and he's very sharp and he knows what he wants and he has a vision and he, you know, is a bulldog. Yeah. <laughs> and, but he's willing to support us and give us what we need to do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. So if we explain it to him a reason why we need something or we need, we feel we should be covering this event, he says yes. Um, love you, Eric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds, it, it's really cool to hear that it's an organization that has not only the passion behind it, the freedom to act on that passion, but also the support that it needs, yeah. right? Because, you know, organizations like that don't survive without financial support or, or you know, direction or anything like yeah. that. So it's really cool that you guys have kind of built a group that, has all of those things mm -hmm. and allows you to to function as, as best you can. Um, I did want to ask about whenever you guys actually write the articles. Like poker can be, frankly, a pretty boring topic to cover, I think, uh, on paper versus seeing it happen live. Like what do you as a writer or what do have you noticed other writers do to keep it um, engaging to a, a reader? I mean, our readers, you either – like poker or you don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're I don't think we're trying to necessarily when we write an article just reach somebody who doesn't care about poker. Mm -hmm. So we we typically are talking to poker fans. Okay. So if they if they think poker is interesting, then that's a good start, right? So whether we're talking about there's all sorts of different articles. You can write a strategy article, you can write a player piece, you can cover an event and who won it, you can break down a hand. So there's all sorts of mediums within poker. Um but I th I think uh, to basically say the same thing I said earlier is like most of the good stories are the untold ones about people stories, mm -hmm. telling the stories of, of people. Um, now, 
you'll hear our, our higher ups, our owner says all the time, the global narrative of poker. Mm. So yes, we're always like, if something big happens, we want to cover it and we want to tell it in a compelling way. Um, and, and in a way, like we don't just assume that the information is enough. Our writers are very good mm -hmm. at, at being good writers. We, the content enough isn't enough. Uh, because like you said, there's so many media outlets out there. Everyone, when something big happens, everyone's going to write an article about it. Yeah. I think having good writing is, is important and an article that you enjoy reading and you appreciate for the content as well. Uh, but just telling those stories about humans are where the majority of the good content comes from. Yeah. Because everyone's going to write who won the main event. Everyone, right. Everyone's going to write that, you know, Helmuth blew up on stream. Those, everyone's going to tell that because yeah. uh, you have to. Yeah. Right? But it. we want to tell the stories that no one else is telling. No, that's cool. No, I, I, I mean, we talked about it enough, but it's just so cool to see organizations like Berkorg really trying to highlight that kind of yeah. stuff because it really is important. Um, how long have – or I'm sorry – how have you seen poker media evolve over the time that you've spent in the industry? Like, do you think the changes that you see are for the better or worse, like moving from away from a lot of like online sites to more like vlogging and uh, YouTube and shorts content? I think that's only good for the game because it reaches a bigger audience. Mm -hmm. And if you reach a bigger audience, then you're growing the game. I, I think we're finally catching up with where other uh, mediums have seen content going, mm -hmm. right? YouTube shorts, uh, YouTube videos, vlogging, Instagram, like it's been done on an individual and a personal level for mm -hmm. a little while, but now it's being done on the company level. Okay. And that's something Poker Org has been really pushing. We, we partner with content creators. Like you've had Sethi Poker here. He's mm -hmm. one we work with. Right. Uh, Caitlin Kamiski, um, all sorts of vloggers that we've partnered with to say, hey, and, and then we put them in touch with events like we were at the Aria Poker Open this whole summer. Mm -hmm. We brought several content creators out there to create content from the felt. I see. To get yeah. eyeballs on the audience, to give it. us content, to give a great bigger reach to the content creator and just like the triad of win, win, win. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think poker media, poker reporting specifically has been dry for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's just been the standard for 20 years of here's the hand history, here's the chip counts, mm -hmm. here's maybe a picture. Um but I would much rather see, in, especially early days of a tournament, like engaging, interesting videos, interviews, um, uh, like videos of hands over just a written hand history. And I realize that like resources aren't always there to do everything we always want. But I think that's where things are going, mm. um, is, is we want a more vibrant, engaging, interesting um uh, content mm. that draws the draws the viewer in and a lot of it's going to be more evergreen when you talk about stuff like that yeah like you know when you write a hand history no one cares in three hours right especially on day one mm -hmm. no one cares it disappears it's not relevant very quickly we want to capture a moment or something exciting and interesting that you'll you'll be able to watch three weeks from now and still appreciate and, and find uh find cool mm -hmm. yeah no that that's really cool it's it's cool to hear you talk about how it all kind of it's like a feedback loop yeah. where, you know, you bring all of the content creators there, you cover things that are happening, they're creating content about the things that are happening and drives that much more engagement to these events that we want to provide outreach for. So that it's really cool that to kind of have that trifecta of different things all happening at once. And uh, it seems like you guys are doing it really well. So, And I, I don't want to talk trash about poker reporters because we we are poker reporters. Right. And there's always going to be a place for hand histories and chip counts. Like mm -hmm. that's necessary to tell the story of a tournament. Right. But there's a place for more. And I'm happy that we're seeing it grow mm -hmm. into more video social content. Yeah. Um, try, you can't please everybody as you, as you move away. From more traditional style of reporting, people are going to demand it. Mm. Uh, I would love to see us in a place that you can have everything. Yeah. As technology adapts and you know RFID tables become more in the mix, mm. uh, and even more technological advancements allow us to track things easier, uh, we can do more with fewer resources that allow that. But for now, trying to tell the story of a tournament in the best way possible, with a goal of making people feel like they are in the room there at the tournament, mm -hmm. more so. Yeah. So you hinted at it a little bit, but what role does like long form articles still play in in media? Boy, this feels like I'm not qualified to answer. <laughs> I'm, I could talk out of my butt real quick. Uh, 
I can speak to what I enjoy. You yeah, know, absolutely. I, I I enjoy reading a piece that deserves long form content. Mm. Um, if it's uh, really delving into a story, each story demands a different uh, medium, right? Mm. Sometimes it's a quick thirty second uh, sound clip. Mm. Sometimes it's a quick recap on the front page. Mm. Uh, but when you're really delving into some like the Galfon series, for example, mm-hmm. very yeah. popular on YouTube, yeah, right very now. cool, yeah. Good luck telling that in 60 seconds on a right. YouTube short, right? That deserves what he did with it, mm-hmm. the stories that he told. So you could have done that as a long-form written piece, but I think it was better as a video. Um, written media, obviously, as we've seen, people's attention spans are shorter. Mm-hmm. People want quick-hitting stuff. But I think there are some stories that just do deserve a long-form written piece. Um, oftentimes these days, though, the stories that do deserve a long-form written piece also get video alongside them mm-hmm. to get people interested. So I think it's obviously as the audience gets younger and younger, long form isn't really what they're interested in. But I think like our age group uh, and maybe a little older still want it and still yeah. still love reading. Um, and so there's always going to be a place for that. But we have to adapt to the younger audience and and provide what, what intrigues them, interests them, and captures their attention, and that's just video in short form. So yeah. I think there's always going to be a place for both, at least in the, for the next 20, 30 years, and we'll see what happens after that. Yeah, so you're not really worried about it becoming like obsolete or anything like that, at least not in the, in the near future. I mean, it's something I don't really have to worry about, to mm-hmm. be honest, because yeah. it will adapt with, with the changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do think it's obviously the reason we don't see people reading newspapers mm-hmm. is like people don't, don't – attention spans are shorter – People want their stories in different ways. Yeah. Um, but there's always going to be a place for it because you can only say so much in, in 60 seconds. You can only say so much with a video piece. Like writing, people still appreciate writing. I, I know I do, so I know there's people like me. And mm-hmm. and we see stuff like, and, and you can do more. Like this summer, one of my favorite projects we did was this Tice Becker bet. Mm-hmm. Tyson Becker had a cross book. Right. With, how uh, we were going to tell it, right? Andy, how right. are we going to tell this story? Are we just going to follow him around all summer? And I had the pleasure of reporting all summer long. Mm-hmm. We did what we call an instant live feature story, and it just sat there. It was like a live blog. Mm-hmm. But when you read it, it reads long form. Like right? mm-hmm. it's just another. So tweaking what a traditional long form piece is. And now I did a summer long long form piece. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was one of our best traffic hits all summer long. And it helped that Dean Eggs was promoting it, obviously, sure. on yeah. his YouTube. But that speaks to what's still possible with written content. A lot of people reach out to me like, man, one of my favorite things to do is pull up at the end of the night and look at the, the banter between uh, Tyson Becker. Yeah. And so we got the access through their group chats and stuff like that. And I just like pull my favorite pieces from their group chats, create mm-hmm. stories about it. And so I think there's ways to tweak a traditional long form piece and make it relevant today. Yeah, no, that's cool. It, it's almost like, daily updates that then after like a month turn into a long form piece yeah. so that that's really cool it keeps engagement and yeah. on top of that anyone who gets on maybe onto the bandwagon like later on can go back and like right. see everything and then catch themselves up so that's really cool yeah I, I um i didn't actually know that that was happening um i wasn't too plugged into a lot of stuff that was happening out at the wsop i didn't go out there this summer um but as i was um looking up some stuff on poker org i saw that and so i was you know doing my own uh research and yeah. scrolling back through and i saw that that was a really interesting thing so that's, that's really cool that you got to cover that that's cool yeah we Both had their, their, like that are good their scoreboard uh was the best part yeah. like and obviously they both ended up losing which they yeah. took a lot of crap for <laughs> yeah. uh but yeah just we updated the scoreboard twice a day every day mm-hmm. uh and, and you could follow along and just see what the current standing was as they got more and more buried throughout the summer yeah, yeah. <laughs> i saw that uh, i mean i think landon was down like 88 or something like that and uh becker was down like 17k so it's it's kind of funny to just see this like all this momentum around something where these guys both just dust yeah <laughs> at the end of the series you know so. and that was that becker got his biggest score like to finish it off to right. get up to 17k to down to 17k yeah. down yeah it yeah. was still fun it was st- like and and those people will look at those results and be like man these are both losers uh yeah. <laughs> the sample size not big enough, not big and, enough. and like the fact that, that they had results that good, quite frankly, was, is, speaks to how good the those large two majority are of anyway. poker players playing the volume that they did during one summer is probably are probably going to lose money. You're yeah. Ch- you're, yeah, if you don't if you don't see the EV that they're chasing, yeah, um, they had they had some shots, they had some runs, but 
uh, didn't happen. Obviously, we wanted to see just massive scores and like who's going to win the most money. But for sure, it was. It speaks to the fact that it's still interesting, even though they both lost, and it's still people were were intrigued and following, even if it's just to you know say how bad they were. Right. Yeah. Just to shit on them a little. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Well, man, you were worried about being qualified for answering some of those questions, but I think you did a pretty great <laughs> job. So I appreciate that. Uh, Good questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, are there any events? That Poker.org is going to be covering that people should be looking forward to coming up that we can maybe find out more about on the website or on socials? Yeah, we've got, like I said, the circuit for the entire season. So the 2024-2025 season, you'll mm-hmm. find us at every WSOP circuit event. Um, we are partnered with BetMGM Poker. So the Borgata Poker Open coming up in September, September 3rd to 17th. Uh, we'll be their official media partner as well. Um, we're going to be wherever the biggest events always are. So we'll be at EPT Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll be at, like... NAPT in November, WPT in this December. So uh, that doesn't always mean that we're being paid to be there or we have contracts, but uh, that's the great thing about being independent. We just go where we want. Mm-hmm. So if there's something that deserves attention and deserves our presence, we'll go there. Obviously, long term, we'd like to build relationships with these people and, and have contracts to actually provide them with what they're looking for. Um, but yeah, we will see us pretty much everywhere. And and. Anywhere we are, including the circuit, Mm -hmm. uh, we did something called uh, pokerphotos.org where we provide professional photography for free. um, Oh, that's very cool. And you can download your own photos. Oh, that's awesome. So if you're you're at a spot where we are, pokerphotos.org, and you literally can request your photo Mm -hmm. and tell us your seat number. We'll send our photographer out there, take a photo, and then you can download it for free. That's awesome. Yeah. That's that's access to a resource that a lot of people don't, you know, normally have. Like if they want to post stuff about poker on their socials, and yeah. maybe they don't want to post like just some, you know, shoddy camera shot on their phone right. or something. But that's a that's a really cool resource. That's awesome that you guys do that. Yeah, I think it's really cool. People yeah. people love their photos, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course, everybody wants to feel like a movie star for yeah. you know even just for a second. So that's cool that you guys provide that for them just uh, for free. Um, well, you already said what you're doing uh, next uh, in terms of the next tournament, but anything big coming up for you that uh, you really want to highlight? Uh, I think I'm playing on Bally Live this week. Okay. Can I say that here on the lodge? You can say that here. <laughs> we, we support all live streams. Like, we, like, you know, people like to pretend that there's like some rivalry yeah. between, you know, Hustler and us or Bally's or whatever. It all grows the game, man. Yeah. I, we're happy to do it. We're successful. They're successful. Why, why should we care? You know, we've had Ryan Feldman on our felt. Yeah. So, like, there's no beef, man. That's it's all good. So I appreciate that mindset. Yeah. I think I agree. Like it's, it's just why people always ask me about our competitors. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I think there's space for all of us. I think as long as we're in it for the right reasons, there's space for multiple media partners. There's mm-hmm. space for multiple live streams, and it's only good for the game. If you were a monopoly, like it wouldn't inspire growth or competition or innovation. You know, or innovation mm-hmm. Exactly. And so I think I'm. Uh, it's my first time on Bally Live. Uh, well, eh. I, I, since they moved to LA, first right. time out there, so I'm excited to hop out there and play. Uh, going up the coast to play Grayton, and then going out to Borgata, and then we're basically nearing the end of the year. So awesome! Yeah, love being on the road. I yeah. really do love traveling. Oh, so really? I'm enjoying yeah. it while it's happening. It's yeah. good that you love it because a lot of people, you know, they, it drains them in some ways. But it's good that uh, that you really like it enough, and that the passion's strong enough to to keep you going on that. So yeah. And when I'm home, I just don't play. So it's yeah. nice. Nice break. Yeah, yeah. My well, my wife probably doesn't think that's often enough but it's <laughs> yeah, fair which is why i don't play i enjoy resting when i'm home yeah that makes sense well awesome man well i appreciate you taking some time to sit down with me it was a fun conversation uh good luck and all the future endeavors even though you've used up quite a bit of it i think this past <laughs> this past week try so. to keep it going i appreciate it i mean great questions yeah. always love talking poker with somebody who loves poker and yeah you know and to do so in this room which i love already is uh, is really cool so thanks for having me yeah absolutely thanks dj thanks appreciate everybody appreciate it brother all right